hello everybody and welcome back to the lectures. So, uh, today we will start a new module which is module 9 that we term as molecular probes and specifically I will be talking about two of them uh, in detail that is PNA which is known as peptide nucleic acids and then LNA locked nucleic acid. So, we have in the last previous lecture we have completed module 8 and where we have talked about some of the techniques that we use in modern uh, chemical biology or in organic chemistry. We use organic chemistry to, uh, to understand or to study biomolecules or to study biological processes. So, this is the new module and we are moving from the modern techniques to a little bit uh, in the molecular level. So, those were the instrumentations. Now, we will be talking about the molecules which are uh, used to study uh, the details of the biomolecules. So, probes I have talked about already I think uh, time to time. So, probes are basically when you talk about a probe, probe is something that you use to track your target. For example, I, I have given this analogy before also like uh, if your uh, the, if the GPS in your mobile is, is on then it you can be tracked, you, uh, you can know where you are your own location as well as the other people if they want they can also know where is your uh, lo uh, location uh, or in other words they can spot you where you are. So, the GPS in this case is a probe, so tracker something that will tell you your exact uh, location or you, your exact stand. So, when you do titration for example, uh, in the school uh, days uh, we used to do titrations where you use indicator and that indicator is usually the colorless or it changes color from one color to the other. So, basically that will give you, so if it is colorless and then you reach a, a neutralization point and then it changes, it gives you a distinct color, it appears in a distinct color such as pink and all these things. There are many, many different types of indicators that we have used. So, by seeing the color you can know that you have reached your neutralization point. So, that is your indicator. So, the change of color or the appearance of a new color tells you that something is happening or that is a probe. So, it, it is a kind of a reporting the, the molecules are reporting to you that I have reached the point where you want. So, that is termed as probe, so which you can use to track something. Probe is something or an object that you use to track a target. Now, when we talk about molecular probes, molecular probes are molecules that are used to track a target. So, certain molecules that you can use that are being used to track a target. So, in this case target means our biomolecules or inside the cells. Example bio 
molecules inside the cells. So, if you want to study something inside the cell, you need a molecule, you need to send a molecule that will go into the cell that will be bound to the target that you want to study and then report you back. It should give you a signal also uh, that I have reached the target and this is what is happening inside. So, those are called the molecular probes. So, it has usually two parts. One is of course, you need a molecule that can bind to a target inside the cell, maybe outside the cell also in vitro, in vivo both. So, you need a certain molecule that will go and bind, be bound to the target that is one part. Second part is there has to be a tracker here. So, it should contain two components one is the binding domain, the molecule should have a binding domain with the target should have a binding domain. with the specific target. Number 1, number 2, the molecule should have a reporter unit. reporter unit means something that will tell you that I have reached there and uh, this is what is happening. Whatever is happening you should able to see it. So, that is called the reporter unit. For example, uh, we use fluorescence uh, molecule and other things. Uh, radioactive labeling that you use in organic chemistry that is also a reporter unit because you can track it, you can see where it is uh, going. So, these are the two basic components that are essential for a molecule to act as a good molecular probe. It should have a binding domain, something that will specifically bind to your target and it should have a reporter unit. Well, so now what kind of molecules that can be used as molecular probe? obviously you can think of many different ways such as if you want to target a specific protein sometimes if you know, if you know uh, something about the protein if you know about the active site of the protein and if you know the substrate that the protein binds to then you can use the substrate you can synthesize the substrate in your laboratory attach it with the fluorophore and then send it to the cell and you, you can expect that since protein substrate binding is highly specific, you can highly expect that your substrate will go and will only bind to the target, uh, to the target protein. And of course, the substrate has fluorescence, so you can see where it is. If you do a fluorescence imaging, uh, fluorescence uh, imaging if you study, then you can see where inside the cell your molecule is. And you can pretty much say that since my molecule is there, the protein must be there also. So, if you have a protein active site, if you use a substrate, it is usually an organic molecule and then you attach it with a fluorescence molecule, this is a fluorescent molecule. fluorescence uh, attachment is there. 
then what you can expect is that your substrate would be here S for substrate attached to with the fluorescence and this substrate should be specific substrate protein binding and you should see the fluorescence. Now, if you do the image, the image will tell you where in if you if this is your cell, you can see the dots, fluorescence dots basically, these are all fluorescence F L I am writing F L, F L, F L, F L. If you see fluorescence marker inside the cell under a fluorescence microscope. So, this is your fluorescence microscope. Then you can see, then you can actually tell that my protein is more likely to be in these positions. Obviously, the, uh, you have to do the reference study also. This can only be your substrate fluorescence as well, but there are ways to eliminate them. With the reference, you can you can do a baseline corrections, and if you have without the protein and only these things, then you can make a matching that will tell you if your molecule only is giving you the fluorescence. So that can be eliminated. So ideally, if you see the tracks, if you see the spots, then you can say that your proteins uh, are also present in these positions. So, that is how you can track the activity of a protein and this can be called a molecular probe. Now, similarly, if you want to track a DNA, if you want to track a gene, especially the diseased genes, something is of uh, um, mutated. For example, you are uh, expecting a mutation that has happened in the genome and in the diseased cells. You want to know whether the mutations are present there or even where the uh, gene is present, what the gene is functioning. That is one to know mutations present in DNA or gene in normal cells or diseased cells that is one. So, you basically want to know whether your gene is perfect or not. Second is also very important. So, if there is a mutation or if your gene is not functioning as you want. For example, what happens in tumor cells or cancer cells is the cells undergo rapid cell divisions right. And rapid cell division means uh, your DNA is also getting replicated. So, more number of DNA is getting replicated that is why you are getting uh, more cell divisions. Now, if you want to one way uh, to stop this, one way to cure a tumor or cancer is to kill these cells. Now, indirectly if you can stop the DNA replication, then the cells will automatically be clipped because if you can stop the replication of the DNA, then there will not be any cell divisions possible and then the growth of the tumor cells will be stopped. Eventually, the cells will die because there will be no DNA inside it. So, they cannot function. So, which we call it. So, if you stop DNA replication means silencing the gene. If you can stop the activity of the gene or silence the gene, this is known as gene, gene silencing or stop the gene from replication. So, if you can use something a molecular probe a certain molecule that will go 
and that will stop the replication of the DNA, then your job is done. So, we can use molecular probes to do these two things. One is of course, to see if there is any mutations in the gene, if there is any mismatch number one, because that is very, very essential to understand the early growth of tumor cells or early presence of tumor cells. Second is, if there is a uh, problem in the gene, whether we can uh, silence the gene. And these are two uh, things which can be done using artificial nucleic acids, which we call the molecular probes. So, two of these have become very popular and widely used in research. To some extent, even they are in clinical trial, one or two of them. But mostly in vitro, we use them a lot in order to know if there is a mutation that is present in your target gene and if you want to even stop the replication of the genes. One is known as PNA, this is peptide nucleic acid other is LNA locked nucleic acids, acid or acids. Both of these are artificially synthesized oligonucleotides. They are not natural, they are not obtained in our body, none of them. We have synthesized them and we use them as molecular probes. The reason is they show PNA both PNA and LNA show uh, activities that is sometimes better than a DNA. Okay. So, first let us go to the structural features and then also uh, we will discuss about their importance why they uh, what they do actually. This is a skeleton of the natural DNA. This is a naturally occurring DNA. I have done it other way around actually. This is 5 prime. It should have been the phosphate here. So, it starts with the phosphate here. This is the 5 prime end and this is the 3 prime end. It will move on. So, 5 prime O, here you have the nuclear base. So, B1, B2, B3 are nucleo bases, they can vary A, T, G, C. So, this is the deoxyribose sugar with a hydrogen here and this is the OH, it will move on at the 3 prime direction and at 1 prime sugar you have the nuclear base, nuclear base 3 prime sugar, 3 prime sugar that is how it is going on. Now, you can synthesize uh, oli DNA oligonucleotides now that we have learnt how to synthesize the DNA oligonucleotides. You can even purchase them uh, nowadays, uh, there are a lot of companies that sell oligonucleotides. So, it is basically the synthesized ones. Now, the question is why you cannot use DNA itself, synthesized DNA oligonucleotides itself as molecular probes. So, you have a gene inside the cell that you want to for example, uh, that you want to see whether there is a mutation or not. What is the way to know to understand a mutation? The simple way is if you can calculate the melting temperature. So, your gene has a melting temperature because that is perfectly complementary. If there is one base mismatch, the melting temperature will be lesser. In other words, the binding if you have a DNA, this is the complementary, then there will be strong binding 
if there is a mutation the binding would be weaker. So, this weaker binding factor you have to consider or oh, that is your uh, point of target basically. If you can use something that will nullify or that will make use of that weak binding part. Now, one way is that you inject or you incubate your gene where there is a mutation which means a mismatch with a foreign DNA that you have synthesized and this is perfectly complementary to this. Then it should go and bind stronger. The problem is DNA DNA binding you already have a double stranded DNA. Now, if you use another DNA from outside then what does this DNA has to do? It has to first unwind this double helix and then make a new double strand with your probe. That is little bit hard to do because both are DNA DNA double helix. So, uh, thermodynamically the process is not that much feasible, it is not perfect. The difference that you will see in your experimental data will not give you 100 percent certainty that my DNA has gone there and be uh, and have been bound there. Because the difference of the melting temperature would not be much, there is always the uh, chance of experimental error also. So, I have talked about before I think that if you have a single uh, base mismatch in your DNA, it changes the melting temperature by roughly around 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. So, one base mismatch or single point mutation single point mutation also is known as single nucleotide. This is very important to uh, remember because this is the term you will come across in many different places if you are studying chemical biology. Single nucleotide polymorphism. In short, this is called SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism that basically means a single base mismatch that is present in the DNA. And many, many, many different types of cancers are actually because of the presence of a point mutation, single point mutations. Even some certain kinds of diabetes uh, are responsible for single point mutations. Uh, epileptic uh, behaviors, epilepsy is because of the single uh, some of the other uh, single point mutations or single nucleotide polymorphisms in the gene. So, it is very important to study them or it is very important to um, find, find out what kind of mutations are present there and where they are present in, in the gene. So, molecular probes is one of the way uh, which will determine in, in the laboratory or even in the cells uh, what where is the mutation that is happening or what kind of mutation there is or how much is the mutation amount all of them. So, using a DNA as the molecular probe is not the best idea because the change or the difference that you will get is, is not that much high or not very distinctive. So, you need to develop something that will be that will have a stronger interaction with your target. If the interaction is stronger then a mismatch will be equally weaker. So, the difference that you get between a strong binding and a mismatch binding would be large enough to experimentally judge that we will see in the subsequent slides. So, this is the natural DNA, peptide nucleic acid is a synthesized artificial uh, oligonucleotide.
and as the name suggests, it is a uh, combination of peptide and nucleic acids. So, if you see this is how the structure of a PNA looks like. In DNA you have started with the phosphate and the 5 prime end from the sugar. In peptide nucleic acid there is no sugar. The backbone is a peptide backbone. In DNA your backbone is for sugar and phosphate. PNA there is no sugar, there is no phosphate there is peptide as the backbone. So, it starts with here CH2, CH2 little bit flexible in CH2 and here this is your peptide bond. So, it is not even a real amino acid, there is no real amino acid present here because this is a CH2, CH2 that is not a part of any amino acid this part is to some extent is present you can say glycine, but it is not really a glycine there is n in between here. So, this is artificial peptide backbone has peptide bonds it has peptide bonds, but they are not part of any amino acids. And here where is the nucleobase? Nucleobase is present here with a uh, Again, this is amide bond or a peptide bond, you can say this is amide bond, and then a nucleobase is attached here. Attached here. If you go by the structural similarities between DNA and PNA, there is two things that is common. One is, of course, all of them have nucleobases. Here also you have the nucleobases. Other thing is if you go by the carbon chain or if you go by the atomic chain length, then the distance between B1 and B2 is almost the same in PNA as was in DNA. Let us see in DNA how many atoms are present, how many intervening atoms are present. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 atoms I think are present between B1 and B2. Here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9. So, very close to this. So, the intervening, so the distance if you go by the chain between B1 and B2 are almost the same as in DNA, but of course, the flexibility is very different here. This is uh, DNA conformation is uh, locked, here also you have as we have talked about you have the uh, resonating structures, you have a double bond character here, but the other parts are pretty much flexible. So, this is the only similarity between DNA and PNA, apart from that there is no other similarity. And the PNA, because the nucleobases are present, it can hybridize. The nucleobases can form hydrogen bonding as well as the pi stacking interactions that were present in the original DNA also. So, that is about the peptide nucleic acids. And then comes the other one that is called the locked nucleic acid or LNA, locked nucleic acid. This is same as DNA, you also use a sugar here, but it is not a deoxyribose sugar. You see this is a nucleobase, base is attached at the C1 prime position which is okay. here this, this, this is your 5 prime end this is your 3 prime. So, 1 prime, 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime and 5 prime. As usual 5 prime is uh, attached to the phosphate and you can move on. 4 prime, 3 prime has OH which you can move on. So, in this case the DNA is proceeding oligonucleotide I will call not the DNA. 
So, you can make the oligomers in this direction and in this direction, this is your 2 prime, this is your 1 prime. So, usually in DNA what you see 2 prime has a free hydrogen here and there is no hydroxyl group. Here you see there is basically a ribose, uh, not a deoxyribose, but a ribose pattern here with the oxygen there, but this is not a free hydroxyl. There is one more here, there was one more CH2 at the 4 prime position, which usually is free here, there is nothing at 4 prime, it is just a H. In this case, 4 prime also has a CH2OH that has been fused with the 2 prime hydroxyl group and you have made a bridge sequence and that is where the difference is. So, the conformation of this sugar is usually locked, you cannot rotate it because that is what you have locked it here, you cannot move then the bonds will be broken, it is not allowed and these are pretty strong bonds. So, your rotation around uh, the flexibility in the sugar is totally gone, here you had some flexibility, here that flexibility is fully gone, that is why this is known as locked nucleic acids. So, let us start with the PNA first, peptide nucleic acid. You can uh, see in the literature, I have not written the details of it. Around 1995 or 96, so not very long ago, the PNA was first developed by Nielsen, Peter Nielsen. So, he first developed the peptide nucleic acids as a artificial base pairs. There are many, many different kinds of artificial base pairs that are uh, available in the literature. So, PNA and LNA and there is one more uh, that I should talk about is the gene silencer SIRNA, SIRNA. I am mentioning it otherwise I will forget. At least you can, you should know the name. It is RNA, it is basically an RNA sequence which is used for gene silencing. So, SI means silencer. SI RNA is a RNA that is used for silencing a gene and that is even clinically uh, used to, to treat uh, certain uh, tumor cells. Okay. So, peptide nucleic acids were used to study its uh, binding or its hybridization with the target DNA and these are the uh, patterns or these are the ways that a peptide nucleic acid can act. So, if you have, there are many different types, okay, let us start with this, this is the easiest thing. So, as I was saying the property or the characteristics of a molecular probe should be, if you have a target DNA. this is a double stranded DNA. If you want to study the property or if you want to study if there is an mutation, what you need to do is your molecular probe which you will be using from the external source should get into this is your molecular probe M P I am writing should be able to get inside the double helix, disrupt the double helix and make a new one. Plus the complementary, so this is DNA 1, this is DNA 2, 1 it can bind, 2 can be made free. Because this binding is stronger compared to this, so the equilibrium in this way equilibrium will be mostly towards this because this will be energetically favorable process. PNA is one such thing, PNA uh, has a stronger binding affinity with the target DNA. It is a double stranded DNA, DS DNA. Now, you treat this with a PNA, then what will happen? PNA DNA binding is very strong 
and this will force so this is pna this is single stranded dna plus this will force the double helix to unwind this is dna2 will present as it is and then pna one dna if this is your complementary sequence then they will be binding strongly and this process is highly favorable thermodynamically so that is one mode of winding so that is what it is happening here and in this case pna doesn't have to be very long it doesn't have to be as long as your target dna the short sequence of pna is uh, is uh, strong enough to make a displacement of the double helix so here in this region your double helix gets displaced it's unhybridized now with the complementary strand coming out of the helix and the pna is getting in there is a new double helix that has been formed because it is thermodynamically favorable so this is one way of binding second is this this is called double displacement originally you had this is the double stranded dna ds dna which is the original sequence now you have treated this with the pna and the sequence of the pna is such that it is complementary to part of your target dna so your target dna has been unhybridized in this part separated out one of this target dna is hybridized to the pna the sequence of the pna is such that there is the other one is also complementary to another pna it can be the another pna or it can be the even the same pna if the sequence matches so it also forms so two pna forms two double strands there and that is a huge uh, binding uh, factor or huge advantage uh, thermodynamically highly highly favorable process if you have two different pna both are complementary to the target then it will fully open the target dna so that is a second kind of uh, binding property or binding pattern i would say third is this this is called triple helix in this case your pna has gone invaded it's called the invasion this is called the invasion into double helix this is called the invasion into the double helix so your pna because this is complementary to the target dna it has invaded into the double helix and displaced it now in this case you have made a pna which has a u shape this and then there is something flexible hairpin kind of and this is complementary to this this has one sequence this has other sequence and both are complementary to the single strand it's the same sequence basically this and this have the same sequence so this you will have a double helix hybridization and then on the other hand you will have a non version creek hoogstein base pairing also here that forms a dna triple helix here watson creek and hoogstein both can be possible that is called the triple helix triple helix are not usual for dna nowadays we use the triple helix as a method to unwind a target dna because the uh, because the energetically this is so much favorable that you get a fully denatured target dna so that is called the triple helix formations one helix here one helix here two double helix three components are involved one two three components are involved that is why it's called the triple helix same thing you can see here is also triple helix this is a longer part this is a shorter part but in this region basically it is forming a triple helix this is the watson creek the other one is hoogstein this is watson creek base pairing that part is the hoogstein 
forming the triple helix. This is called two double helix, di double helix or something and this is the single inhibition. So, these are the uh, hybridizations that you can see. PNA due to its higher affinity towards target DNA forms various invasive complexes with double stranded DNA. One is called the triple strand that is this, this is called the double duplex. You have one duplex here, or you have a second duplex here. So, this is called the double duplex and C is the duplex invasion. So, it is a invasion into the single duplex and this is of course, the triple strand again. So, these are the ways that a PNA can be bound. These are the sequences you can see. This, this has the same sequence. So, it, it will be hybridized here, it will be hybridized there. This is the longer DNA. So, the other part, this is also the bent, this is also the bent, all of them are bent structures. So, they are forming the tip, triple helix basically. All right, here also you can see schematic representations. This is even more variation or called the pseudo complementary nucleobase. So, you can forget that. PC term you can forget, just consider the PNA. If you have a DNA, this is double stranded DNA, here you add the PNA into it, you can see there is two double helix that can be formed. That is how you can, you can make lot of designs to prevent the target DNA from rehybridizations. Here, this is the PNA is bound here, bound here, this is the DNA oligo and this is for the ligation, you are forming a different kinds of complex here to study different things. Many variations that I just I want to show you. Two homopyrimidin PNA uh, openers, you can go through it. Okay. So, this is little bit away from the main design, little bit more modification from the main design. So, the question is what makes PNA to have so much strong binding with the target DNA. So, in other words, I should mention here very important as I said that binding is strong means higher melting temperature. So, basically if you calculate the melting temperature or melting point, if you have a DNA, DNA means DNA double helix and if you have a DNA PNA double helix, DNA PNA double helix has much higher melting temperature compared to DNA DNA. Similarly, this again has much higher melting temperature compared to a PNA PNA double helix. If both are PNA strands, very strong interactions, very strong hybridization. So, melting point of a PNA DNA is higher than a DNA PNA than the DNA DNA. The question is why is that? Both cases you have nucleobases, the normal nucleobases ATGC. The difference is in the backbone. So, what makes the backbone so much advantageous compared to a DNA DNA double helix? First thing that you can notice here is in DNA if you have phosphate groups negative charged. So, when you want to make a hybridization DNA DNA hybridization, there is always the repulsion repulsive force between the phosphate groups that is a good repulsive force actually. It destabilizes the double helix and that is why I have mentioned when you want to get a DNA hybridization, you always need to use a salt to overcome the repulsive uh, repulsion between the phosphates. So, nevertheless, two DNA if you bring closer together, even if they are complementary, there will be a repulsion between the phosphate groups. That is a destabilization factor for the DNA double helix formation. PNA on the other hand, if you look at the backbone, is neutral, does not have a charge. Therefore, if you make a hybridization of DNA with a PNA, then this repulsion will not be there. So, that destabilization factor in DNA DNA is not present in DNA PNA or in PNA PNA. 
that is why that is one of the reason why the melting temperature is higher or in other words the hybridization is stronger. Second is the flexibility. The conformation if you see of the PNA and in the DNA, PNA has more favorable conformation. It allows better hybridization, better stacking between the nuclear bases. So, that is another advantage or that is another uh, stabilizing factor for PNA, PNA uh, double helix or DNA, PNA double helix. So, these two are the prime factors that are responsible for better binding property of the PNA. Now, why you would use it as a molecular probe? Another thing uh, that is of high concern when you want to use something to move into the cell to inject into the cell is that the cells as I have said repeatedly the cells are very highly protective usually. They do not allow foreign bodies to enter the cells. So, if you use DNA as a proof if you want to inject a synthesized DNA oligonucleotide into the cell that most of the times the cell will not allow the DNA to enter because DNA is highly dangerous. Virus, bacteria, those contains DNA and so the cells know that DNA are highly uh, uh, notorious and they will have lot of impact on its own gene. So, they do not usually allow the DNA to get into it and our cells have uh, enzymes called nucleases, you have heard the name nucleases before. Nuclease is the enzyme that will cleave the DNA into pieces, even DNA and RNA both would be cleaved by the nucle uh, nucleases. So, the moment you will use an artificial DNA, the moment it gets into the cell, it will be broken into pieces and you cannot do any, uh, you cannot study anything with that. PNA on the other, other hand, because it has a more peptide backbone, cell walls uh, are friendly to peptides. So, they allow the PNA to enter into the cell and it does not have phosphate bonds. So, it is not a substrate for the nucleus. Nucleus cannot break PNA because nucleus usually breaks the phosphate and the sugar uh, bonds. So, nucleus cannot break PNA, nucleus cannot destroy PNA and since it has a more like a peptide backbone, cells sometimes allow uh, the molecules to get into it. So, it is a better molecular proof in terms of when you want to do the living cell studies and of course, it has the advantage that it will have a stronger binding. More or less is the same for locked nucleic acid. This is uh, to some extent uh, stable with nucleases because of the structural variations nucleases do not uh, take this as substrate most of the times. It is to some extent uh, stable uh, with nucleases and of course, it has a better binding property. So, also uh, LNA when it comes to LNA, LNA, LNA double helix has higher temp melting temperature compared to LNA, DNA and compared to DNA, DNA. So, this is melting point. Now, I will give you one example. If you have let us say ATGC, ATGC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This has the 8 base pair sequence, right? DNA TACG, TA. C G is the double helix. So, if this is a DNA, usually this will have a melting point which is close to maybe 20, 25 degree Celsius, 20 to 25 degree at most close to room temperature. Now, same I am just writing this if you have a PNA 
let us say this is your DNA, this is your PNA, either of them A T G C, A T G C. If this is a PNA strand, that will have melting point close to 55 degree to 60 degree Celsius. So much difference this is close to uh, let us say 55 degree Celsius for the PNA, PNA DNA sequence, PNA DNA sequence will have a 55 degree Celsius melting temperature and the DNA DNA sequence having the same sequence is only 25 degree Celsius. So, the binding strength is that high for PNA and now if you talk about a mismatch, if there is a single base mismatch somewhere it will reduce the melting temperature by around 7 degree. So, in this case if it is 25 minus 7, so around 18 degree Celsius if there is a mismatch. If there is a mismatch in PNA, I have seen, I have also worked to some extent with the PNA that it changes the melting temperature by at least 15 to 20 degree. So, here it was 5 to 7 degree change, in this case it would be around 15 to 20 degree less if you have a single base mismatch there. So, if the difference is high then you can see if you by simply studying the melting point you can see that there is some mismatch over here because this cannot be an experimental error 15 to 20 degree Celsius cannot be an experimental error. 5 degree can be here and there instrument problem, instrumental error, experimental error it is so much close to the normal one. This is a huge difference. So, you can pretty well uh, understand and study or find out even what kind of mutations are present when you use the PNA as a probe. Here I will give, an, give you an example, a real example that we had done. So, this is a DNA wild type means the original DNA 60 mark long DNA this is this has a 60 base pairs sequence. Here is a fluorescence level that you can forget and this is a mutated DNA where there is only a single mutation single change the original one was G and the mutated one was C same 60 base pairs uh, sequence. This is actually a sequence that is present in rice blast pathogen that destroys crops especially the rice. This is called the uh, some mildew and that uh, pathogen has this uh, DNA sequence here. The problem is uh, when you use pesticide to kill those pathogens eventually those pathogens have mutated themselves so that the pesticide does not work on them this is the known mutation that the pathogens have done within themselves. So, that they will survive even if you use the pesticide they will survive because the pesticide does not bind with this sequence when there is C it does not bind. So, you cannot kill that. So, this is the part small sequence which is changed into this of course, which is important where the pesticide used to bind only this much sequence this much is the important part of it and this is the important part where you have the mutation. So, we wanted to find out how much mutations is present or if in general this is a 60 mark long sequence with only a single change in the genome if you are able to find that out it is actually hard to find that out. So, we have seen that if you use a DNA sequence instead of PNA and you hybridize both wild type and the mutated they almost uh, give you the same results because it is too long and finding out about the small difference here using the DNA was too hard. DNA probe does not tell you the difference between the wild type and the mutations. Now, if we have used a PNA probe with this sequence G means it will hybridize with this with the mutated version. Then it shows a huge difference. Now, if you hybridize this 
separately with oil type and mutation, then you can see the high change of melting temperature. So, that and through that you can understand that this is your mutation, this is your not mutated or wild type. Only a very short sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, nuclear base uh, sequence, very short sequence. This is here it is there in proper geometry. This is the DNA, sugar phosphate backbone, this is the PNA with the same nuclear bases that are here, but the backbone is now a peptide backbone. See here double strand if you have a DNA DNA double strand full match then the temperature is 23 degree Celsius. If you consider that this DNA DNA has a 23 degree Celsius melting temperature the same length using only a PNA instead of this DNA full match has a melting temperature around 73 so high huge difference and these are the patterns. So, thermodynamically pattern this one is thermodynamically favorable, this one is of course, thermodynamically favorable. This we can discuss in the next class. So, how PNA can be used as a molecular probe to make different designs and to find out the mutations in the cells. So, this we I can discuss very briefly. The advantages and disadvantages of PNA that I was talking about. So, this is a PNA, this is a DNA. Advantages of PNA is PNA has neutral backbone as I have talked about and therefore, is an uncharged species. PNA hybridization is independent of ionic strength, you do not need to use salt because there is no charge. PNA probes are better target specific and has higher melting temperature than its DNA analog that we have seen. So, details of those including the synthesis we will see in the next lecture. Thank you.